Jason, what's your favorite time frame? It might sound kind of boring, but I'm a daily guy. I mean, I, I love to bring in the weeklies. I do love to zero in on the, the short-term charts. I do bring in, especially when I'm actually going to, to place a trade, really kind of you know, narrowing in on a, uh, a specific price. Um, I'll, I'll jump down to a one minute chart, one minute to oh one wow. minute. Yeah, just to really see how it's trading. Yeah. It's generally still over about 75 days. Um, so it's really kind of packed in there. The data is packed in there, but I like that, that view when I'm actually going to place a trade. But I mean, for most of my analysis, it's, uh, it's a daily chart. And actually the one sort of unique thing that I do is uh, a year and a half. So I find that uh, you know two, three years is a little bit too long, but one year just doesn't quite bring in enough for me. So there's something about a year and a half that's, that's been working for me, and that's, that's kind of the, uh, the frame that I like to view, a daily chart over the last year and a half. That's but really funny, because that is mine too. I is it really? A year and a half, yeah. My wow. default chart is a year and a half. Beautiful. Yeah. You bring in a lot of weeklies though. Well, I use weekly a ton. So um, probably the thing I look for the most is a big downtrend in PPO momentum on a weekly. Yeah. And when that trend line's breaking, now I want to go to dailies. Yeah. I like to see where the big picture is. And if I get a downtrend on a daily PPO and a weekly tr PPO, and then when I go to a 60 minute, if there's one there, I'm just kissing the ground. <laughs> like I'm ready to go. It's the magic and sauce. When everything lines up, and I think a uh, good friend Brian Shannon brought yep. up the point, I think his book is uh, Multi Time Frame Analysis, yep, yep. or I think is the title, Great something book. like that. Anyway, the, uh, it, it's that thing. When all three of them are setting up and yeah. you get the chance to buy it right there yeah. Yeah. and then just wait. Yeah. Please wait. Yeah. So, but yeah, I like the year and a half because I, I, I just want to know where its next level of resistance is. I want to make yeah. sure it's hitting new 52-week highs. I like to see those breakouts. And when you have the chart set too tight, you can't really get scale. Right. Yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, I find that it just works. Yeah. Works really well, just enough of a view. Greg, you've been working with stock charts for quite a long time. What's what's the background? How did you first get involved with uh, with stock charts? The stock charts and I got together back in 2011, and I was the Calgary chapter chair for the CSTA. That's right. And one day on stock charts website, they said, "If you would like us to come out and speak, send us an email." So I sent an email, and Chip called me back and said. Who are you and whatever? <laughs> and so we started to chat and he flew up to Calgary and he presented to us and went for dinner, had a nice conversation and Chip said, why don't you just start writing on the website? And yeah. I was like, wow, um, haven't done that before. So my first articles were long. They were like books. <laughs> and, um, and then you started to realize that it was a more concise document would help on a blog article. Sure. Um, so they, over time, I've been writing, but again, I think I'm going on 11 years yeah. now. Um, it's been a long time, and we've had lots of fun together. Yeah. Um, I chart have, cons I and all have that stuff. almost 400 chart lists built into my files, and so uh, you know, literally, there's 10 years of work there. Yep. And I can go back and look at how I was thinking about things, you know, in 2012 when the metals topped. Yeah. Um, you I can all just scroll back on those charts and yeah. see all that data. So it's a lifetime things. of watching the markets there. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? So mine's interesting. I mean, you know my, my father, so he was yeah. a, a trader when I was growing up um, and was always a chartist, had been for a long time. And so he actually had been using stock charts um, really kind of my whole life since stock charts was, was founded. He explored it, you know, came from the meta stock world and found stock charts. And um, so as crazy as it sounds, I, I grew up looking at, charts from the time I was about 10. He started teaching me about the markets and things like that. So I remember seeing stock charts on the, uh, on the kitchen table there as a kid, looking <laughs> at uh, you know, what was working and all that yeah. stuff. And then eventually took a, a sincere interest in, uh, in markets and just kind of fell in love with it and, and technical analysis specifically. So I uh, ended up working at, at stock charts as an intern and then as a business manager and eventually is uh, in my, my role now as, as VP of operations. So it's just kind of rolled from there, but it's been a a great fit, you know, my passion for the markets and then passion for, for stock charts. And it's just kind of always been a, a piece of my life in a strange way. But yeah, so, and it's, I mean, it's just so fun to connect with, with you and so many of the other experts that we have. It's, it's an amazing group of folks that have been writing and doing videos and stuff like this for, for a long time. I think the most um, important thing we've done over the years is get people together every now and then. Yep. And 
you know, having them Martin Prings and John Murphys and Dave yep. Kellers and Arthur Hill and Julius yep. and just bringing everybody together into the room, um, preparing. A lot of times it was a timestamp of what was going on right then yeah. and the different views and perspectives. And I, quite frankly, could not replicate that anywhere yeah. in, in my world. Those yeah. were fabulous um, events just to get everybody yeah. working together. Always. Yeah. It's always special. Yeah. Who do you find yourself reading or watching most on Star Trek? So of, of all the contributors we have, um, whose work really kind of speaks to you? Um, I, I follow a lot of Dave Keller um, stuff. Yeah. Probably the reason that um, Dave and I uh, think more alike, he taught me institutional behavior, mm -hmm. like looking for three month relative strength highs or 12 month relative strength highs or six months. Having not been in the business, I didn't have that kind of background. Yeah. So I learned a lot from him. I think the, the way he sets up his charts, we have some similarities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he, he fits my mode a lot. I don't use the RSI very much. Mm -hmm. Arthur Hill's a brilliant technician. He's an RSI, RSI guy. guy. Yeah. And I just, uh, each indicator kind of pleases somebody's eye. And for me, it's the PPO and my scooter rankings and spurs. Yeah. I, I just, I don't use the relative strength as much. So that's probably why I'd lean to somebody like a Keller yeah. more than, yeah. Yeah. How about you? All you guys. I mean, it's it's uh, it's tough to get any work done because I'm always trying to follow what you guys are, are putting out. But um, you know, I think that the two that stand out, obviously John and, and Martin, um, just their their work has has been tremendous in the industry. But I think what's interesting now, I follow a lot of Martin's work because generally it's a longer term perspective, and it's kind of a perspective that I'm not always thinking about. Yeah. So it's a great way to to follow a perspective that I, I should be thinking about. Every time he puts out an article, it's it's always just a fantastic read. Um, and the other one is is John's. You know, John is writing a little bit less these days, but every time that he puts out an article, I know that it's really important, and I know that I need to go read it. So John and Martin still are, are just they got to be at the top of my list. So Martin's still a, a very uh, big friend of mine. We yeah. talked here just a couple weeks ago. Um, I read his intermarket analysis mm -hmm. every month. He yep. does. Uh, a newsletter over 35 years now. Yeah. It's just crazy. Very impressive. Um, but I, on some of my charts, I still have KSTs and I still yeah. have his special K. And like when the US dollar was trying to break out yeah. this year on his special K chart, I was like, I don't think it's going to. I don't think yeah. it's going to. Then it broke out. And sure enough, that was the trend change. <laughs> and, and on it went. And it was like, OK. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, no, it's. It's just so nice to, and, and the other thing is it's a collection all in the same place, so you're not it's running true. all over the web to try to find exactly. the work. It's all in one spot. It's a so lot of perspectives, but yeah. it's, uh, it's all valuable, all yeah. right there. When you see the market rolling over the whole thing, like mm -hmm. January, um, what, how defensive do you get? Do you just yep. sell everything? Do you hedge, whatever? So that's what I'm going to ask you. Okay. Okay. So... One of the big things that, you know, I think William O'Neill taught a lot of us uh, about was that when the market rolls over, typically everything gets caught in the tidal wave mm -hmm. and the market pulls down together. When you see a big kind of run up starting to lose its momentum and roll over, how do you handle that? You know, I'm, I'm trying to stick to my, my disciplined approach to selling. I'm trying to get out when the charts tell me that I need to get out. But the, the interesting thing is that I'm a, I'm a bit of a younger guy, and so I've got different sort of buckets, I like to call them, in my portfolio, and they move in totally different directions. Okay. So I've got long-term, the, the big long-term bucket that's you know the 10, 20, 30, 40-year money. Mm -hmm. And when the market starts to roll over, that's when I start chomping at the bit to go buy more. Um, you know, Hopefully, I've been, been raising a little bit of cash as the market's going up. And when it starts to pull back, I mean, something like March of, of 2020, ends up being an amazing long-term opportunity for that bucket. Right. The other bucket, the trading bucket, moves in the exactly the, the opposite direction. That's the one where I'm getting out of those trades, I'm going to cash, and I'm sitting and waiting for the market to say, no, 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 we're done selling, we're, uh, we're, we're gonna start moving back to the upside now, we're gonna strengthen. Um, so it's, it's interesting that they actually move in totally different directions. 
um, you know, depending on what your time frame is, depending on what your, your purpose is. So the trades, you know, market starts to weaken. I'm getting out. I can, I can sit in cash. That's fine. Yeah. Um, or, you know, rotate into the opportunities that are working. If utilities start to work, you know, maybe I'll pick up some utility stocks or, or um, you know, some different ETFs in that space. Mm -hmm. um, but the longer term money is, is doing the opposite. What about you? It's a, it's a hard thing to do, though. I mean, you see the market rolling over. What's, what's your process? What's your, uh, your approach? You know, I, I really struggled because I, re I started investing during the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis. Yeah. So I got burned pretty hard. I bought Apple. They'd come out with the iPhone, and I was losing money in the stock, and I yeah. couldn't figure it out. I was literally dumbfounded. How, how could I be losing money? And yeah. I got, they've got this wonderful product, making yeah. better returns every quarter. Um, so that's when I really got my CMT decision mm -hmm. to, to start. And then even after that, I was fearful of the market rolling over and just taking away my capital. Yeah. So that, that scarred me quite a bit. I ended up creating some strength indexes to try and help me. Okay. And I, I'm going on my third year with them and that has totally changed my investing really? model. Literally like a light switch, the chart just changed. And what happened was near the bottom when it starts to turn up, I want to be a buyer yeah. and I don't kind of go 10% in and wait to see what's going on. I'm mm -hmm. like, bang, go in. Yeah, time to move. And then it will roll over mm -hmm. and it might be a 5% correction or a 10% correction, but a lot of times it's a change in leadership as well. Yeah. So I'm just as fine to move right back out Yeah and go down. Now, in some cases, let's say, whatever, you're in commodities and they've been running, I'll put a stop under it so if they start to come down, mm -hmm. I'm out. But normally, the rest of the portfolio, like tech or whatever, I would just roll out to cash, wait yeah. for the low to come in. And that indicator gave me eight buys last year. Wow. Eight, eight different signals for buying. And if you only rode them up, yeah. it was a pretty nice year. Yeah. And so um, I didn't get caught in the SPAC stuff. I didn't get rolled over because yeah. my system didn't let me. And so that was very helpful for me to try and find a method of supporting my decision. Mm -hmm. So if my big picture view is rolling over, my stops are pretty tight. And in some cases, I'll just leave everything like whatever. Okay, I've got three oil stocks working. I might sell them and just say whatever. If, if they keep going, they're going without me and I'll wait for my next buy signal. Yeah. Um, but it, it was, that was one of the big changes I made in my life was trying to find more confidence to get back into the market early yeah. and not being afraid to sell. Yeah. So when we talk about selling, what do you do to try to sort of get yourself to be able to sell? I mean, it's something that a lot of people struggle with. They just have this, uh, this hesitation when it comes to selling. Are there emotional tricks or things that you do, things that Greg Schnell does to make himself a better seller, a more willing seller? Well, I will say that once your trading becomes profitable, mm -hmm. it's easier to sell your losers. Yeah. And the reason is if a loser starts to go down, you're like, enough of this, I'm out. Yeah. But if you're a person who's been holding a bunch of losers, it's hard to sell because you're just kind of admitting defeat. Yeah. And and I've, I've been there, we, I, we probably all have. But the the emotional decision to sell is hard. In this case, I'm now using this indicator that keeps track of market momentum. That's that's really what it does. Keeps track yeah. of market momentum. But when it kicks off sell signals, I'm just out. I'm not. I don't yeah. like to go short. Shorting's hard at the bottom. Basically, it's a six or seven percent move against you. Yeah. You had to either leave the day before or or you give it all back. So I'm not a big shorter. Yeah. But I think the the real clue for me was just having something to help give me the confidence that if I sold here, fine. Yeah. And if if it ended up turning back up, then just buy again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I like that. That's that's important. That was helpful. Yeah. Um, the the one thing as let's just restart a whole set here. This year 2022, the charts have been much different than they have been for 21 months, really. Yeah. And as, as the market rolled over at the top, it was kind of a hard clue to figure out if it was how hard it was going to come down. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people had a 22% pullback on the NASDAQ figured out. Um, 
so getting back in has been okay, but the trick has been it's been up and it's been down. It's been choppy. How do you handle that chop? Ooh, how do you handle that chop? You know, it it all comes down to me to uh, on the sort of the trading side, the the things that I'm that I'm jumping into. It comes down to running those scans, sticking to the process, sticking to the routines, um, and ultimately trusting the system, trusting the charts. Um, you know, watching things closely, watching my indicators closely, the relative strength figures, all that stuff. Um, you know, I find that the, the closer, the more disciplined I am in sticking to the system and executing the routines day in and day out and week in and week out, that's what gets you through those kind of choppy environments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it allows you to still find the opportunities that are working, put some trades on, stick to the system, stick to the, the rules and everything, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, execute it and kind of get through the, the choppiness. But it's hard. It is, it is definitely hard. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing is just continuing to watch the charts. The, the nice thing about a choppy market is you can set your, your range on it, right? I mm -hmm. mean, you see where the range is. You know that there's a top of that range. You know there's a bottom of that range. And everything in between is just kind of fluffy. Um, so it's, I, I almost like the, the, the well-defined market of a choppy sideways market because you kind of know yeah. what it's doing. It's, it's different in, in a lot of ways to a strong trending market like we've seen in the last couple of years where you just always feel like there's got to be a top, there's got to be a top, there's got to be a top. Um, that in, in, in some sense is almost harder to trade. Um, so what about you? What, how do you find yourself navigating through a, a choppy phase like we're in right now? Well, the, so my strength indexes will turn up and get me involved. Yeah. But then if they start to fail early, that's another signal. So yeah. like literally they'd get 50% and roll over instead of going all the way to 80 or 90. Mm -hmm. So that was a clue that market health wasn't there yet. Yeah. Um, but you still have to get in on each one because you don't know which one's going to go to 90. Right. That's, that's hard. Right. Um, so that's been okay. I think the, the thing that's really different for me this year is the changes that are so big on the charts, like yeah. the Japanese yen breaking to new 20-year lows. Okay, they're the largest debt-to-GDP central bank in the world. Mm -hmm. What if all of a sudden there's a run on the yen, and what does that do yeah. to the global economy? So I will say that the broader picture is focusing me on really preserving capital, like mm -hmm. I'm more defensive than I would have been. Yeah. But when you start to see 20 year trends breaking in something important like a G7, yeah. I, I don't want to just walk away and go, oh, no big deal here. Yeah, that's not yeah. going to have any <laughs> knock on effects, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. You know, and we've got the, the bond markets breaking big trend lines, we've yeah. got the currency markets breaking big trend lines. So that yeah. adds hesitation to me too. So I'll, I'll still put on trades, but I'm much quicker to take profits. I'm not waiting for, yeah. for a bad day at the office. It's important so to know that, right? Yeah. I mean, it's important to know the bigger sort of context of, of the, uh, not just the, the small little sector environment that you're trading, but, but the U.S. environment, the global environment. Yeah. It's important to understand all that and trade within the context of what's happening out there. Even if you're not trading the rest of the world, That's you know, right. you're yeah. still affected by it. Well, in, it, in the picture of the... You know, you look at Japan on a map, and it's between China and Russia, as Russia's in the Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, they're buying their energy uh, with yen. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, yen's falling, so their energy costs are going up. Energy's already spiking. They're going to double whammy where their currency's getting hit, yep. and the cost of the goods are going up. So right. that's really hard. Yeah. And I think being unaware of kind of those macro risk yeah. factors, again, it might not matter if I'm trading a trucking stock in Canada or the U.S., but... Yeah. Being aware of just how um, hesitant the market is here, if all of a sudden charts start to fail, we yeah. can have a bigger problem. Right. Yeah. So I, I like uh, the macro, macro backdrop is a pretty big thing for me. Um, one of the things I started to keep track of was just the number. I have one concentrated chart list that I do a lot of my relative strength work on. Okay. And if the PPOs as a group yeah. are, are rising, mm -hmm. We're in a pretty big market, like it's yeah. going up. And we saw that for a lot of 2020 and early 2021, and then it started to slowly low down. Well, yeah. got to like 75% of my list, and then it just started collapsing. Well, that was literally January where the- Yeah, we saw those start Where to you roll. just start to see it. So it was interesting that the chart told you to be ready, Yeah. 
and then it followed through. Yeah. And so now we're, I'll call it, we're about 40% on that thing. So it either turns back up here and gets back into a bull phase, or if we roll down again, we still got to be more careful. Yeah. So I like having macro indicators like that as sure. well to overlay with my trading style. Makes sense. Grayson, you and I have had similar but different approaches to the market. I've kind of leaned heavier towards the commodities. You leaned a lot into the technology area. I think I like the roller coaster of the technologies. You like the simple, smooth trend of Microsoft <laughs> and stocks like that. <laughs> Tell me some of the reasons that you like to invest in tech and how, how you find the charts kind of help you do that. Well, you know, I think for the, the last couple of years, that's just where the strength has been. We've seen so much outperformance coming from that group. So it's been easy to be super bullish in tech. But, you know, that's been changing in the last uh, few months, especially the last year, really. So that started to shift for me. And it's been an interesting kind of mindset shift, um, you know, getting away from where we've been really for the last couple of years. Um, you're kind of seeing the opposite. What are you seeing, you know, commodities really picking up? That's a mindset shift for you, too. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, so really metals topped in 2012, oil topped in 2008, and it's been a long, long slide. Yeah. Um, so in Canada, we've been investing in the commodities as well, but we've had some tech names like Shopify and sure. Movie that have done really well and, and had some nice runs, but Lightspeed was another one. Yeah. Uh, there's been some great tech names there also, and you know the U.S. has got really um, good opportunities that way. I think the single biggest transition that we're coming into now that's showing up on the charts, um, we've underinvested in all of the commodity development, and yeah. it's really been, I don't want to just say environmental resistance, but everybody's trying not to damage the earth, so nobody yeah. wants mining, nobody wants oil, nobody wants metals of any kind. Mm -hmm. And we've underinvested so much that it feels like to me we're literally standing on a springboard where yep. if it, unless we're going to live through a major energy crisis, we've got to do something pretty darn quick. We've got to make some changes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So I'm really starting to see that. But the one that got me the other day was, um, you know, I think if you take whatever CNQ and it's up a thousand percent off the lows and somebody said, we're starting to see the beginning of an energy bull market. <laughs> and I was going... Okay, that's uh, a little <laughs> slow on the pickup there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Missed the first Quite thousand the start, percent, but, right. I'm, but I'm getting involved right. now. Right, yeah, 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 now okay. I'm taking a look. <laughs> yeah, so it's nice that the chart's coming around for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think the, the one thing that charting has helped me with over the years is not being afraid to get involved when something turned up. Um, I have a great example. A friend of mine, a couple of years ago, might have been before COVID, mentioned, uh, you know, Greg, what are some charts you like? And I told him about CNQ, and I told him about precision drilling. Yeah. He was a fundamental guy. So he goes and he looks, and he sees CNQ, you know, okay, well, you know, oil was in trouble, and it wasn't looking very good. And he looks at precision drilling, and he's thinking, that company's bankrupt. Yeah. I think the stock got down into like the low single digits and it's at $82 today. And he's like, okay, that stock just keeps killing me. Yeah. <laughs> you keep right. looking at it. And the, techno the, the technicals told us the turn was underway. Right, right. But the fundamentals obviously took a year before they started to improve, but the chart literally took off before that. Yeah. It was one of the big changes in my life was to ignore the news and watch what the investors were doing. Absolutely. And it's a repeatable tool. You can yeah. actually take this tool, take what you're seeing on one chart, apply it to another chart in the future, apply it to the next trade, apply it to the next investment. It gives you a framework for actually seeing what's happened in the past yeah. and then seeing what's going to happen in the future. If you're just trying to reduce everything to fundamental numbers on a piece of paper, it's really hard to do that, especially when you've got all these different industries and different sectors and the numbers are different across one. You know, yeah. what's overvalued for tech is going to be completely different in the energy space. But the charts are the charts. I mean, price is price, and we can see breakouts, we can see strength, all of that. Yeah, I, I'm not an Elliott Wave guy, and one of the things about the Elliott Wave is, you know, to mark up the charts, you need to keep kind of a detailed history with all your, your counts going on the chart. So that isn't kind of the technicals I like to employ, mm -hmm. but the one thing I really like about charting 
I'll call it using PPO and yeah. and some some uh, moving averages. Sure. Um, I like the scooter ranking. I like relative strength with the S and P 500 or the Nasdaq. Yep. Using some of those tools, it doesn't take me very long to decide if I like a chart. Yep. And I don't need all of the calculations. I don't need a earnings book. I don't yep. need to wait for earnings. Yep. You're not I'm sifting through reports no. and endless yeah. documents. Literally, that chart shows me, as soon as I zoom out on timeline, zoom back in on the close period now, Yeah. Um, it, it's just so much easier to invest yeah. with that data for me. And some people will say, well, you know, what about what they've got coming? I, sorry, I don't know what they have coming, but yeah. I know the investors like it. Right. I yeah. know the chart's setting up <laughs> yeah. and it's moving yeah. and it's outperforming. Yeah. Yeah.